So whales are normally thought of as a mostly pelagic group of animals, but what if I told you they regularly go not just close to, but often inshore? And this is actually more natural than you think. Yep, this is going to be one crazy video talking about all sorts of cetaceans. From humpback whales all the way to killer orcas. This video is going to get really crazy really fast, so let's cue the intro. It's a humpback whale, and behind it, that would be the Empire State Building. Uh, these orcas have shown a curiosity for swimmers, but people are reminded to keep their distance if they do see whales. So yes, believe it or not, whales can be found in both fresh and saltwater environments. But with the exception of river dolphins, which have specifically evolved a multitude of different traits in order to survive in freshwater full-time, most other species of cetacean lack these adaptations, meaning that they can only survive in freshwater for short periods of time. This is because saltwater cetaceans have very specific skin cells that are perfectly adapted for releasing large amounts of salt. And in a freshwater environment, these skin cells would simply continue to hold more and more water until they eventually become hypotonic and explode, leading to large amounts of skin disease, which could cause severe stress and eventually kill the animal. But surprisingly, their biological limitations do not stop these animals from occasionally entering the mouths of rivers and even going upstream. Some species which do this somewhat regularly include the humpback whale, orca, and bottlenose dolphins, all of which will regularly go in and out of freshwater ecosystems for short periods of time. The bottlenose dolphin does this most often as they tend to live primarily near and inshore, where they will regularly swim in and out of man-made canals and rivers while hunting for food. In these rivers and canals, the dolphins will regularly encounter both brackish and fresh water, but since fresh water mostly floats when the salt water and fresh water initially mixes, it creates a very strong halo cline, where the fresh water will float on the surface, meaning that all the fresh water food sources will be on the surface, while the salt water below will contain a variety of different salt water food sources, allowing for the dolphins to spend the vast majority of their time in the salt water below, going up to the fresh water in order to feed and gain access to the surface where they could breathe of course. Still if these bottlenose dolphins go too far upstream where everything becomes entirely fresh water they won't be able to stay for more than about a day as their cells aren't built to tolerate entirely fresh water. And sadly in areas where extreme tidal changes are common dolphins do occasionally get stuck and end up dying in freshwater ecosystems if they spend too much time outside of a saltwater halo cline or habitat. Thankfully though this this occurrence with dolphins getting stuck in entirely freshwater habitats is incredibly rare as dolphins tend to have an incredible level of spatial awareness which humans simply lack and dolphins are incredibly smart animals capable of timing tidal changes assuming they are used to the location in which they are at. So for this reason bottlenose dolphins and some other species of smaller cetacean don't tend to get stuck in lakes or rivers particularly often. And I guess it's about that time in the video where I should probably mention that manatees do not count as cetaceans. Manatees don't seem to have any problems traveling in between salt and fresh water the way dolphins do. This is because manatees could regulate how much urine they produce and have much tougher skin adapted for both salt and fresh water. And manatees aren't even closely related to cetaceans, and instead are sirenians more closely related to actual elephants than they are to whales. And we're also at about that point in the video where I should probably also mention that it's not just dolphins that occasionally go in and out of rivers and freshwater ecosystems, it's also the much larger baleen whales too. Yes, believe it or not, the largest group of animals on Earth in terms of size, the baleen whales, will also occasionally enter the mouths of freshwater rivers and even go inland, with the humpback whale being the species known for doing this by far the most often. And while this behavior has been observed across the range, it seems to be the most common in the North Atlantic and North Pacific. This makes sense in the North Pacific, where the humpback whales, in addition to many other cetacean species, spend a large amount of their time in the inside passage of Alaska and Canada. I've actually been lucky enough to go whale watching multiple times this past summer in the Inside Passage of Alaska and it was an incredible experience being able to see these humpback whales up close and actually in a very unusual environment. And while the Inside Passage on its own isn't technically
technically a river, it does contain access to a lot of river mouths, which release large amounts of nutrients into the inside passage, creating the perfect environment for all sorts of fish species, ranging from cod to salmon, which nurse their young in these habitats, and the whales love to eat them. Especially humpback whales, as they're a mostly generalistic baleen whale species, not just feeding on krill like a lot of other baleen whales. This is actually why humpback whales are by far the most abundant in the inside passage compared to other whale species. That and also because humpback whales are known for being very talkative, which the other whale species don't like. And because of their favored prey sources and their very social behavior, it's not too uncommon to see multiple large humpback whales traveling upstream from the inside passage into these large river mouths in the pursuit for food, where they sometimes even get stuck trying to pursue their required 1.5 tons of food each and every day. Thankfully though, as most of these whales are residents, they are able to navigate these river mouths pretty easily. Unlike another more predatory cetacean, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but first, feel free to like and subscribe because I need your money. Now, getting back to the video, this behavior has also shockingly been observed somewhat regularly in New York and also New Jersey, where humpback whales have even been recorded swimming inside the Hudson Bay River and even going a decent bit upstream into New York City, where pictures like this are are becoming increasingly common due to better protections being put onto all sorts of marine species and their respective habitats. Sadly though, whales in rivers isn't always a good thing as there's been plenty of cases with whales traveling so far away from the ocean that they simply can't return and end up dying in freshwater ecosystems. Usually due to a combination of skin disease, not enough food being available, and even in some cases heat stress. But usually these cases are caused by human factors, such as whales being trapped in nets or having their navigation skills disrupted by man-made machinery. Surprisingly though, the humpback whale, despite its incredibly large size and how abundant they are across the world, doesn't seem to be the species of cetacean which gets stranded the most often in these freshwater habitats. That title seems to go to the beluga whale. If you didn't know already, the beluga whale is a highly specialized species of toothed whale which spends the vast majority of its life in the Arctic Circle. And similarly to the bottlenose dolphin, they love to hunt in fresh water, but they seem to have a much higher tolerance for being able to stay in fresh water for longer periods of time. And while they aren't a truly freshwater cetacean species, it seems like their very thick, tough skin does help them stay in fresh water for a longer period of time. Still, despite them being found up to 600 miles up the Amor River, these species are not entirely built for freshwater, and that makes cases where they get stranded outside of their range even more concerning, especially because it's becoming even more and more common. Already, beluga whales have been found inside of rivers in France, the UK, and even New Jersey, all of which are pretty far from the Arctic Circle, to say the least. And while it isn't entirely known why these whales are going into these freshwater rivers so far out side of their native range. The current main theory though seems to be that the whales have been following the polar vortex which tends to move somewhat frequently throughout the year and due to climate change the placement of the polar vortex has been becoming more and more unpredictable throughout the year. And while trying to follow the polar vortex, which carries cold air throughout the Arctic Circle, these whales end up getting stranded during cold fronts and often are found far outside of their native range. And since they can't navigate back for one reason or another, they end up going inside of these rivers in hopes of finding some food, which doesn't seem to pan out that well for them as they end up either dying from skin disease or heat stress since they have too much blubber to survive in a temperate or tropical climate. This theory could also apply to some other whale species as well, but right now it's just a theory. Just a very sad theory which nobody wants to hear. But on a lighter note though, not all of these whale strandings are entirely bad for everyone involved. Going back to the Northern Passage, when these humpback whales do on the rare occasion get stuck in these freshwater rivers due to their large size, their main predator, the transient orca, will often follow. And if you didn't know already, there are many different types of orcas, both localities and species. But in general, resident orcas mainly live in one small area and primarily feed on smaller fish and other specialized food items. While transient orcas travel hundreds if not thousands of miles in the search for food and will eat pretty much anything, including whales. And unlike their resident counterparts, since these transient orcas are very opportunistic, they will gladly follow the whales' calls upriver in order to feed. 
And since the orcas are smaller than the humpback whales, they are able to navigate these rivers with relative ease. The only real advantage the humpback whale has over these orcas when it comes to being found in the rivers is that humpback whales have whiskers. Yes, I didn't know this either until recently, but these whiskers help act as an extra form of navigation while in murky water on top of their echolocation and incredible homing skills. But still, this isn't enough to completely avoid predation from these killer whales. And while such events are poorly understood and poorly documented, every so often orcas do end up killing humpback whales and feeding on them in the rivers. Not just in Alaska, but likely other parts of the world as well. Though such a fascinating behavior remains to be studied. Overall, it seems like the theme of saltwater cetaceans being found in freshwater rivers and streams is incredibly understudied in almost every case. It doesn't seem to matter if it's bottlenose dolphins in the Florida Everglades, or if it's beluga whales being found 600 miles upriver in Russia, or even resident orcas which occasionally also go upstream in the search for salmon. All these cases are incredibly understudied, and I'd love to see people start dedicating more of their time and effort into researching all these wonderful cetaceans and how they've been adapting to survive at least temporarily in these freshwater ecosystems. Heck, there's even one case in New Zealand where it seems like a bunch of bottlenose dolphins have been able to survive full-time in the freshwater fjordlands of New Zealand thanks to the strong halo clines that could be found between the surface and the deeper, denser salt water below. After all, we're on such a big blue planet, it really wouldn't surprise me if there's tons of other examples of these saltwater cetaceans surviving perfectly fine in freshwater for long periods of time just waiting to be discovered. I mean, there's even been reported cases of blue whales being found in freshwater rivers, so who knows what else we'll find in the future. Maybe it's even possible that some of these baleen whales could evolve to survive in freshwater full-time the same way the river dolphins have. But in the meantime, what is definitely possible is for you to like and subscribe so I could continue making more incredible animal mini documentaries in the near future. After all, if this video does really well, I might do some more videos on whales in the future. But in the meantime, time thank you for your adsense money and goodbye